The uh, three panelists here will each be speaking for about 15 minutes each, and then at the end of that time period, there'll be a question and answering period. I'm Joe Laker. I'll be serving as the moderator. Uh, I taught history here uh, and retired about four years ago. The first speaker will be uh, Father Jim O'Brien of the Philosophy Department. The second, Chris Stadler of the Political Science Department. And finally, Jessica Robleski of the Theology Department. Okay, and uh, I don't think we're going to stand up and talk. This was just to get everybody to be quiet for a second while I introduce the speakers. So you're going to remain seated, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Jim? Yeah. yeah. I'm Father Jim O'Brien. I'm happy to be here and to see so many of you here very freely. I know as soon as you saw the title and uh, the topic, you <laughs> said, man, that's where I've got to be on, on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. But thanks for coming. We hope that it's going to be a worthwhile time for you. Uh, maybe just a moment by way of introduction to, to explain why it's the three of us that are here. And simply, uh, what we do, what we're doing is representing um, a couple of courses that are still in progress for this semester, which were pretty explicit about taking into consideration uh, the elections. So uh, uh, Dr. Statler and myself uh, were team teaching a course, uh, Adventures in uh, Citizenship. Uh, and uh, what follows from that. Um, we're very grateful for the Institute for the Study of Capitalism and Morality because uh, uh, we usually don't get two teachers in one course and they were the ones that helped finance this. It's been a lot of fun for myself and a great learning experience. Um, I'll not speak for Dr. Stackler. No, you can. It's, it's, <laughs> it's been fun. It's, it's been fun for you, too. Yes. Okay, and then Dr. Robleski uh, has done a course uh, in which she's talking about citizenship, too, from uh, uh, the point of view of, uh, of theology and religious studies. Um, we're not here to represent a, uh, a position. What we're here to do is to reflect a bit on, uh, on what we've uh, found in uh, doing our classes together, but most especially um, our uh, growing uh, reaction uh, to the terrible year that we've all just put in. Uh, I'll speak for myself, but I think I'm including uh, my fellow panelists, is uh, it was pretty much a waste of time. Um, the, the questions that weren't asked and the kind of sense of, uh, of entertainment um, that seemed to be the um, idea in setting up debates and limiting them and focusing them the way we did. Um, you know, I, I found myself using expressions like the whole process was scandalous. You know, we supposedly the greatest country in the world, and we just put on a spectacle as we've done uh, for the last year and more. What were we trying to prove? Um, where did all that money come from? And literally billions of dollars in an economy like ours why would anybody have a priority like that in dealing with our present situation? Um, so we're coming, you know, not favoring one side or the other. My task, as I see it, is to speak from the angle of being a Jesuit and being a member of the philosophy department <coughs> and to try to share with you uh, uh, the angle of vision that's ours here at Wheeling Jesuit, what we hear pretty constantly what our mission is and uh, our great concern about justice and peace. Um, 
So I'm speaking from that angle. And I think I've already indicated to you that I'm feeling pretty disappointed about where we are right now and feel a real call to make some suggestions about where we might go from here. And perhaps I should say that where we might go from here, our, our community. So, so a point that I'd like to make initially is that we're a very favored community. The fact that we're small, the fact that our departments and the faculty are usually not large numbers, the fact that many of us are veterans here of varying lengths. We know each other, we respect each other, and, uh, and we have students who have come attracted and for the, all the many reasons that have brought you to this university. And we're proposing, at least I'm proposing, that the best thing that could come out of our gathering tonight is to gain a couple of adherents, I hope, to trying to be serious about asking and answering the question, where do we go from here? What do we learn out of um, these last months and year and more of uh, viewing on television, uh, seeing uh, so many negative ads, finding it just an ugly time, and wondering whether this is the greatest democracy in the world at work, or we've got some kind of charade going. So that's my personal conviction. You might want to differ with it in question and answer. But we're not here to try to favor one side or the other side. We're just trying to stand back and say, uh, they haven't given us very much to play with. What is it around here that we could do to try to make this a valuable source of education for ourselves? I find myself talking mainly to, to a student group. And if I'm not going to ask any questions, you know, how many of you were registered? How many of you voted? How many of you were really pleased with the opportunity of voting that was given you? Um, don't want to embarrass anybody. In fact, I want to say that it, it makes a lot of sense if somebody said a pox on both your houses. I don't even want to get involved in this thing. It doesn't make any sense to me. It seems to be so contradictory. It seems to be so deliberately confusing. It seems not to be serious in really getting to the issues. So, uh, you know, if people said, thanks, uh, uh, I'm glad we don't have another one of these things in such a major way for another three years or so, that's understandable. But I'd like to think that we can do better than that. And I would encourage especially people who are feeling that way is to get involved where it seems to me you're pretty pleased to be involved in, in service, in contacts uh, uh, with outside groups. People uh, thinking seriously even if they can't fit it in because of schedule or finances to go to New Orleans, or to Camden, or even overseas. To get that sense of connectedness with real people and get a better sense and conviction of where some of the real problems might be. So uh, I'd encourage that over just giving up on the whole thing. I'd also wonder, though, if we can't in our classes find ourselves hungry to learn and to come to classes. Um, we represent uh, three different departments, but there were, are many others involved, not excluding in any way the business department. We're having in mind what has happened, 
we might be able to gear our courses in ways that would try more seriously to get to the real questions. To see, instead of just giving up on the confusion, that we might learn together and from each other what it is that needs to be going on. Um, and maybe you're still too insulated from that. But in a couple of years, uh, uh, you'll be finished your undergraduate work. Some of you going on professionally and uh, into graduate studies. All of you taking up life in a much more connected way. So to get started now, asking yourself the honest questions, you know, what do I expect my government to do? Uh, how does this thing work? And am I capable with others of challenging it to work better? We're probably not going to be able uh, to do very much about lobbying. But maybe we get convinced as a community that whatever we can do to convince our representatives to put some kind of limitation on this sort of thing. So that, again, the charade that, uh, that parades as democracy, as we've seen it and experienced it in the last year, might be more challenged in, in the future. It looks as if there's so many special interests who uh, seem to exercise uh, their privilege of making their positions known by contributions. That's going to be very hard to dislodge. But it seems to me it's a real question to ask and see if we can come up with any ways um, to do this in, in, a, in an intelligent and in a challenging way. Um, so what I'm proposing is that we don't give up, uh, that you keep trying to make your education really alive through the focus that service and contact with the outside world can give and that you encourage us faculty uh, to be people who share your concerns and want ourselves to see if we can get a better light on the real questions. In just a few moments, my colleague here, Dr. Statler, I think is going to give us a real good example of where from political science he's seeing the, the, the problem, the real problem that's at work, which is a structural problem. It's something that we tend not to look at, but he's suggesting from his expertise that we look at a little bit more fully. If I could just take a few more minutes with um, just two brief examples of what I think from the last, uh, from the campaign, were real questions, and wonder whether in classes, or maybe keeping a series like this going, if there were a second or third or fifth, it wouldn't involve us. There are lots of other faculty, I think, who would be capable of helping us, again, get to the real questions and try to make a dialogue out of this, not beating up on each other, not growing ugly and, and, uh, and, and really uh, distasteful with the way we do it. Let, let me give you very briefly, two examples that I have in mind. Um, I think there was a great argument, a great shouting match, a lot of vicious ads around about not raising taxes. And on the other hand, um, um, taking care of those who are poor. So the, the one side is, is, is saying that we need to do things to help those that don't have the resources. I think the example that we've just had of the terrible storms back east it was a good example, certainly uh, unusual, but real critical time. But a society that wants to move out, given a, a particular situation like that or a more enduring situation like uh, trying to raise small children as a one-parent uh, family. Um, but the desire to do something about that problem and uh, on, on the other hand saying we can't afford giving uh, uh, our money away, stealing by 
charging us new taxes in order to, to raise our already outstanding debt and really just give people an entitlement that they're asking for. So there's real bitterness over that, I think, and a real sense that there's something wrong with doing that. We shouldn't be forced to take care of lazy people. Well, let me as a philosopher just step back and recalling uh, Sister Helen Bray John's visit with us a month or so ago, and the deep conviction she gave a whole lot of us to be thinking about capital punishment and, and, and even uh, taking care of, of people who have done atrocious crimes, not just eliminating them. I'd raise the question, are we convinced that we've got the right to life? Not because our government's given to us, but that's a natural sort of thing. Our, our uh, founding documents seem to proclaim that. Those of us who are Christian and Catholic uh, have that deeply embedded in our values. We all of us have a right to life. And if we're convinced of that, then as a community, how about uh, the right to the things that are essential for life? Food would be one. Shelter would be another. Education. And we could drop a few others that if we don't have those, if they're not available to us, then we really can't activate this right to life that we all of us claim is our innate uh, uh, dignity and the responsibility of the country as a whole to try to satisfy. So instead of shouting entitlements, or even speaking entitlements, as a kind of a global description of all that, I'd like to get into a conversation with somebody who holds that and just research together and see what kind of agreement we could come to about the right to life. And therefore, the right to essentials that ensure that right to life. See, I, I just think that we need to make that, get that kind of dialogue going to see if we can get a foothold to continuing the conversation. Okay, how do we take care of people like that? Where do we take care of them? In a great crisis such as New Orleans or back east a few weeks ago, it's pretty obvious that a, a local person can't do that. Uh, certainly, people at the local level will try to do what they can do, but sometimes problems are so great that you need a higher level to handle those. If we could get into that kind of conversation, not an ugly conversation, and one that's respectful of each other, I think we could begin to take some steps to what's a very, very complicated uh, problem. And just one of so many in, uh, in this conundrum of how do we live together in peace and harmony in a country as large and as expansive and as multifaceted as our own. Um, let me stop there. I have an, a, another example, but I'm conscious the time's getting on. I think it's really important that we make a conversation about this. The simple point I've been trying to make is we've just come through a really sick time together. And I don't think any of us ought to be satisfied with that. And I'm suggesting that we could ask the question of ourselves and collectively, what can we do here to try to improve on that? How can we get to be more reflective and more, and more free about the, uh, the opinions we develop? We need each other to do that, especially the differences that we have. So I'm saying get out and learn the differences, service again, get to classes, and ask teachers that they might be getting at these substantial questions. And as a community, I'm suggesting, maybe it's time for us to devise some ways that we can make this conversation ongoing, informal, if you will, gatherings maybe in the residence as well, but that we're, we're trying together to learn uh, what's very essential for us all. Again, how do we live together in harmony? How this great nation that is ours how can we function with relationship to other nations? How can we get to the real questions? 
despite what seems to be the ways of delivering them to us, it's been just such an agony to experience. Now, Dr. Statler is, I think, our next speaker. As I've indicated, what he's going to try to do is to focus, uh, as a political scientist, into some of the things that he thinks were really wrong this last time. So if you will, thank you. Thank you. Um, for my part of tonight's gathering, I would like to focus most of my remarks concerns with an eye toward Congress and in particular the House of Representatives as it was designed to be our most important representative institution. That said, I would like you to think about two things. First, what did you think you were doing or trying to accomplish with your vote in this past election? And second, how much of your time is politics and democracy worth? As you consider your answers, I would like to begin talking about some of the things that, despite their importance to the health of our democracy, were not discussed at all in this election cycle. It is perhaps new, not too far of a stretch to suggest that we don't even think about them at all. The first is representation. What are we voting for? We've become so accustomed to the idea of representative government that we tend to forget what a peculiar concept representation actually is. A representative claims to act or speak for some other person or group, but how can one person be trusted to speak for another? How do we know that those who call themselves our representatives are actually speaking on our behalf rather than simply pursuing their own interests? Generally, the primary circumstance under which one person reasonably might be trusted to speak for another occurs if two or more formally bound together so that the representative is in some way accountable to those he or she is supposed to represent. If representatives can somehow be punished for failing to speak properly for their constituents, then we know they have an incentive to provide good representation, even if their own views and interests differ from those they represent. This principle is called agency representation and is the sort of representation that takes place when constituents have the power to hire and fire their representatives. You now may be sitting back in your seat saying, yes, I voted for candidate X or candidate Y, and my purpose was to punish or reward an incumbent for not representing my views or interests. Or I'm supporting candidate X or candidate Y because they will represent my views later. It would seem that this criteria for representation is working and working well. In recent years, people have re-elected their Congress members at a rate close to almost 90% of the time. But there is a potential problem here. Can a representative actually represent or know what your views are? Does to say that you are represented mean that you are helping to determine what those in power will actually do? It turns out that when contrasted with other forms of political participation, the most important of which is lobbying, where you take your case either individually or through an organized group directly to an official, voting is the least effective means of participation. The reason for this is that a vote can convey only a general sense of approval or disapproval. Voters may support a candidate for many reasons, but their actual votes do not indicate specifically what they like and don't like, nor do they tell officials how intensely they feel about issues. In effect, representatives are being allowed a certain amount of flexibility to decide when they think they should act on the preferences of their constituents and when they should make decisions that they think best. All right, you may be saying by now that this, must, this is much more along the lines of what I was thinking when I voted for my representative. After all, I may not know or have a strong preference one way or the other for all of the issues my Congress member will probably be asked to vote on when they get into office. If this is the case, however, how do we explain the fact that public trust in government has declined and Americans are more likely to feel that they can do little to influence governmental actions? According to public, in, in, excuse me, according to public opinion surveys, only once between the years, only once between the years 1959 and 2010 have more than 50% of Americans trusted their government to do the right thing most of the time. And this is connected with the 9-11 attack. Think about that. Congress in some years doesn't even go much beyond 20, a 20% approval rating. And yet, we continue to vote. Is this what we mean by a democracy at work? More importantly, do we need to be concerned about any apparent lack of governmental legitimacy and representation? One's answers depends on how serious we think about the problem. Several plausible interpretations can be given. 
The first is that the polls simply reflect a large number of people who don't vote on a regular basis because they have already decided that their vote, that their vote will make little difference or that their opinion doesn't matter. They remain pessimistic and don't expect much to come out of Washington. Although this is a bit troubling, considering the fact that the number of people who feel this way could be very substantial given that around 60% of potential voters don't vote in off-presidential years. The issue of mistrust need not concern us very much. This is because most of these people, Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street movements notwithstanding, have not taken very much action. There still seems to be an unacknowledged level of trust. Continuing on the positive side, because there are evident levels of trust in government action, albeit low levels, low levels, and typically hover between 30 and 50 percent, this may reflect the views of those respondents who do vote. Similar in consequence with regard to taking no action, a second explanation could be what Eric Fromm has described as an escape from freedom. Citizens may be unhappy about some of the legislative results, but given the complexities of a confusing political world, and given the uncertainties of how to proceed with strong preferences, they have been willing to simply transfer the onus of making difficult choices onto their leaders without seeking to apply electoral consequences. The next two explanations should be of more concern as to what it is we think we are doing when we vote. Social science research indicates that the public operates under an erroneous assumption that the majority of the American people agree on policy matters. In more than one study did participants adamantly state that 80% of the American public agree on what needs to be done about serious societal problems, but it's the other 20% who have the power. Despite the fact that virtually every well-worded survey question about tough policy issues reveals deep divisions in the nation, mistrust exists because the public will not admit that disagreement actually exists. The people simply project their own particular views, however ill-formed, onto a clear majority of other real people. Those allegedly few people who allow it to be known that they do not hold these views are dismissed as radical and noisy fringe elements that are recorded far too much influenced by polemical political parties, self-serving special interests, and spineless, out-of-touch elected officials. Sound familiar? The next explanation extends the previous one and, be, and is perhaps the oddest. The reason that people are so disgruntled with politics in Washington is because they are actually dissatisfied with the processes intrinsic to the operation of the democratic, po democratic political system itself. Believing that political problems can be solved quickly and easily because there is a national consensus, political debates and conflicting information easily come to be seen as bickering. <coughs> Bargaining and compromises come to be seen as selling out and our intricate system of checks and balances comes to be interpreted as unnecessarily ponderous, inefficient, and slow. According to John Hibbing and Elizabeth Thies Morse, although many people claim to love democracy, they only love the concept of democracy. Certainly this reflects a disappointing view of democracy for people who believe in freedom. All of the explanations, although troubling, can be lived with excuse me, as attested to by the lack of any serious alternatives being put forward. I would like to note, however, that rather than reform the entire system, some 60,000 people from the state of Texas would, as we speak, seek to secede. At this point, you could, of course, simply assert that I am making a big deal out of nothing. After all, how many times have we heard that the general public is ignorant, apathetic, wooden-headed, stupid, or fickle? But does this make sense for a nation that describes itself as a superpower? Are you satisfied that there may be citizens out there, maybe yourself included, who for one reason or another obey the government, but mostly distrust the actions of your own elected officials? What I would like to do now is discuss what I think is a more plausible explanation, one that is structural and incorporates the others above. Our democratic imagination, the promise of democracy, has been taken away by our inability to ask the questions we don't ask anymore. We have come to accept our current electoral system as natural and even inevitable. To my knowledge, the following question has not been asked or alluded to in any of the political debates, commercials, or by the media. Can Congress, can Congress members represent their constituents in any meaningful way? The framers asked this in 1787, and they thought in their time, with a population of three million people, and where the national government would not do much other than facilitate interstate commerce, 
That is to say the national government was expected to stay out of and let state governments do most of the governing and dealing with the many divisive social issues. They could rely on one representative for every 30,000. One representative for every 30,000. By contrast today, where we have over 300 million people and the national government plays a much, much greater role in our daily lives, we have decided that 433 representatives in the House is sufficient. Once we do the math, we find that we have one representative for approximately every 600,000 people. I'll repeat that. We have one representative for every 600,000 constituents in a congressional district. But why? Do we know something more than the framers knew about representation? Even countries with far fewer populations have more representatives. The House of Commons in England has 646, the French National Assembly has 577, and the German Bundestag has 614. And oh, by the way, the number of the represented will continue to grow as our population increases. Someday the ratio may be one to one million. But importantly, have you ever asked yourself why? Like most Americans, probably not. But this is indeed a strange, but this is indeed strange since a whole number of representational problems flow from this low number. The reason for 435 is that Congress passed a law in 1929. By setting this number, Congress effectively made apportionment a zero-sum process. As population shifts occur over time, some states gain congressional seats while others lose. Importantly, States lose even if their own population has grown from what it was when they had more representatives. But note too that Congress, instead of maintaining or granting people a bigger democratic voice, chose to solve the representational problem created by problem population growth by watering down our voices and therefore making it much, much weaker. Still the question lingers as to how House members can pull off what has to be seen as a representational miracle. How can one person possibly represent or discover the interests of all their voting constituents? The answer is, of course, they can't. They cheat. In what has become known as the highly political process of gerrymandering, congressional districts are redrawn by state legislatures every 10 years according to the latest census. By the way, one of the main purposes of the census was to ensure people are represented. What makes this process political is that the majority party in each state's legislature typically tries to influence election outcomes by constructing congressional districts that give an unfair advantage to their own party by clustering constituents along party lines. The ideal situation is to create a permanent majority more minority party district. Such districts have come to be known as safe seats. Indeed, usually there are less than 100 races out of the 435 House seats that are considered competitive. This past election, I think the number was below 60. There is, of course, no guarantee that one's party will win, but one has gone far towards stacking the deck. Not surprisingly, House members, although they represent an entire district, only need to worry about turning out, mem tur turning out members of their own party. If you're a member of the other party, your vote will typically not count for much. Knowing who they must re represent to win re-election also means that a representative is not likely to change their mind on very much. That is to say, excuse me, that is to really listen and modify a core position based on that. We see this today with the Republicans and the issue of tax pledges and tax cuts. They could of course compromise, but their compelling logic is simple and straightforward. How can they or any other representative repudiate a position that got them elected in the first place? As a result, compromise in general has thus become harder to find even in the face of a fiscal cliff. The other side effect of our apportionment process is that you start to get rid of moderates. When re-election matters most, and apparently this is the driving force for many legislators that David May Mayhew has effectively shown, one's adherence to what the party of, excuse me, what the majority of party constituents believes becomes paramount. If they are more, if they are more conservative one, one must become that. If they are more liberal, they must become that. How far one can reach out within the party and beyond depends upon the makeup of the party base itself. It is simply too unlikely that members of a particular party will switch and vote with the opposition. 
It is also unlikely that a majority of constituents will be devoting enough time to finding out what policies their representative actually supports. Independence, of course, complicates matters, but most districts do not have large enough numbers of them. This representational situation is further compounded by the fact that the House has a two-year election cycle. It can be asked, why with such large numbers of people to represent, would we want such a short cycle? With so many constituents, is it little wonder that representatives send so much, to so much of their time raising money and campaigning for the next election? Have you ever asked yourself why we have the two-year cycle? The Federalist Papers, which is a body of newspaper articles written mostly by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, meant to explain why we should ratify the proposed Constitution in, say, 1787, tells us nothing more than that two years was selected because it falls somewhere between one and seven years. Madison is worth quoting. As it is essential to liberty that the government in general should have a common interest with the people, so it is particularly essential that the branch of it under consideration, the House, should have an immediate dependence on and an immediate sympathy with the people. Frequent elections are unquestionably the only policy by which this dependence and sympathy can be effectually secured. But what particular degree of frequency may be absolutely necessary for the purpose does not appear to be susceptible of any precise calculation and must depend on a variety of circumstance with which it may be connected. I would only note the word sympathy and variety of circumstance. Of course, what time representatives do have is spent on legislative tasks. In particular, becoming a specialist in, in particular, becoming a specialist in what are the most important interests of their district. In oil rich states, for example, members of the House are likely to become leading advocates of the oil industry. To be an advocate means trying and usually getting onto the appropriate House Standing Committee. In the case of oil, it means being on the Energy and Commerce Committee. The democratic downside to this is that if the vast majority of House members specialize, they know very little about the other issues they will be voting on. They simply do not have the time or the inclination to understand the ins and outs of, for example, the Agricultural Committee and their work on corn. What this means is that legislative decisions are made without, without much open debate or expressed interest by other members. Many bills are passed via the process that is known as log rolling. If I vote for your bill, you vote for mine. It is also important to note that a focus on re-election and limited amounts of time also creates what Terry Moe has described as a collective action problem. Congress is simply unable to deal with large problems or serve as an effective check on the president. Another casualty is our system of checks and balances. According to Madison, checks and balances function from the, person, from the principle that ambition must be made to counteract ambition. If no institutional ambition exists on the part of the House or Congress in general, is it little wonder that the United States has not declared war since 1941 or that the USA Patriot Act was passed with only a few members actually reading it? It is my argument that until we address the basic apportionment issue and a longer elective cycle that, that we can actually meet the needs of a modern democracy. Thank you. All right, so um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just take a, take a minute here and offer some instruction. Um, I, I was passing around a, a piece of paper. It says Professor Robleski F and C, which um, those of you who are in my faith and citizenship class, um, you know, probably recognize that. I see a few folks from theological ethics as well. Um, if you are in theological ethics and you sign up on that sheet, then I will um, I will count that as extra credit towards your grade. So try to find that sheet. Um, <clears throat> so speaking of my classes, I um, sometimes make a point of saying um, how it's significant to pay attention to who's included in our we. That first person plural pronoun is something that can carry a lot of weight in ethics. Who is acting here? So, um, you know, pr Professor Father O'Brien um, had mentioned, you know, we as a Wheeling Jesuit community, that that is who is included in our we. Um, Professor Stadler, sort of spoke about the we of American citizens, those who hope to be at least represented by our democracy. Now, the we that I want to talk about, um, you know, as a sort of representative of the theological faculty here, um, is we the church, um, we um, the Christian community, and maybe more specifically, um, the, the Catholic church. 
Um, so I want to offer a few theological reflections on this theme of the 2012 election and the question of where do we go from here. Um, and I'd like to begin with a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and purpose. For it has been reported to me that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Obama, or I follow Romney, or I belong to the Republicans, or I belong to the Democrats. Has Christ been divided? Was Romney crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Obama? Now, obviously I've changed some of the words from this passage, um, which comes from 1 Corinthians 1, sort of 10 through 13. Um, but really, uh, the ways in which I've changed it, I think does not actually do any kind of, make any kind of alteration to the point that Paul was trying to make. He was speaking to um, the ways in which there was partisanship and factions that were growing up in the the church in Corinth. So people were saying, ah, you know, I follow Cephas or I follow Apollos. I was baptized by Paul. I'm, you know, we're, we don't have anything in common. And so Paul here is saying, is Christ divided? What's going on with all these factions among you? So Paul's message here, as in many other places within his New Testament writings, is that all other allegiances of Christians need to be subordinate to their allegiance to Christ and their recognition of a common membership in his body. So <clears throat> if we're really honest with ourselves, and uh, people in my class know, you know, we've kind of wrestled with, um, you know, what political advice does the Bible give us? Um, if we're really honest with ourselves, we have to acknowledge that um, a lot of the biblical scriptures are kind of a step removed from some of the policy questions that we face today. The Bible doesn't give a lot of explicit advice about politics, um, although within each of the synoptic gospels, Jesus does tell the people that it's legitimate to pay taxes um, and that that obligation to Caesar is always um, relative to their obligations to God. Jesus tells people to love their enemies something which maybe has political implications. Um, he shows well-being for the poor, and he has some very challenging words um, to, the, to those uh, who enjoy material wealth. But he doesn't really have that much to say about trade deficits or policies regarding unemployment or education or same-sex marriage. Um, there are, however, many unequivocal statements both in the teachings of Jesus and in the writings of other letters within the New Testament um, that do offer strong admonitions to unity and harmony among believers. So, for example, in his lengthy prayer at the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus asks God to sanctify his believers in truth. Um, and truth being something that I think has been um, really, really pushed aside. This is a sort of aside from my point of view. But I think that um, you know, this is maybe one of the questions that remains um, or that has been flagged, I think, as a problem. Um, the appearance of fact checkers and the sort of dismissal of them, um, I think, is something that um, should be of concern um, for, for all citizens, but maybe particularly for those um, who follow someone who says, you know, the truth shall set you free. So Jesus says, he asks God to sanctify his believers in truth, even as they are being sent into the world. On behalf of all who believe in him, Jesus prays that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as you and I are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. So here there's kind of this statement that the, the witness, the power of the Christian message is, has a direct relationship to the unity that's found among believers. 
Paul writes, and this is a pretty often quoted phrase, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Is it possible that this Christian unity then should extend to say that in Christ there is neither Republican or Democrat? Um, If so, what we see in the church today um, is a far cry from this. Um, Now, uh, you know, most exit polls and national media coverage um, indicate that Christians, if we take the whole body of Christians, are incredibly divided, not just among political issues or because of political issues, but for all kinds of reasons, the liturgical sensibilities and all kinds of other things. Um, If we focus on the Catholic Church, and this is true of the Catholic Church, um, not only because of the outspokenness of the Catholic bishops on this, on things like the HHS mandate and same-sex marriage, um, but also because of the prominence of certain Catholic politicians, you know, both both, both, blah, both vice presidential candidates were themselves Catholics. Um, the most prominent figures in the House of Representatives are also Catholics. Um, but it's unclear what, if anything, that allegiance, um, how that affects the ways in which people behave and act politically. Um, on the screen behind me, you can see, and I'm just going to stand up here so I can kind of point, um, the Catholic vote. And you can look at it across the span span here. And kind of the point um, that a lot of people in blogs and other kinds of articles who have been writing on this have said is that actually the Catholic vote tends to mirror the population in general. So it's unclear whether or not that allegiance actually makes any difference for the way that people vote. Um, And not only that, not just the way people vote, but also the way in which people engage in dialogue. Um, I think it's interesting, though. Um, you know, if you look at the Catholic vote, um, 50%, so a, a majority of Catholics voted for Obama over Romney. But then if you see the breakdown of this, um, so white Catholic versus Hispanic Catholic, you can see here um, there's actually a pretty significant difference, and it's precisely reversed. So among white Catholics, um, 60% voted for Romney over Obama. Among Hispanic Catholics, 75%, um, which is actually higher than in 2008, voted for Obama over 21% for Romney. Pretty significant. And I think that that points to another division that we see within the Catholic Church. You know, so this question of race and ethnicity, and do we have a church that is not only segregated and fractured among pol- or along political lines, the same political lines as our community overall is, um, but that is also divided in some significant ways along lines of ethnicity and race. Um, so in, it's, it's interesting, um, in light of some of this, um, the Catholic bishops recently had their national meeting um, Is it still going on, Brian? Yeah. Yeah. So the Catholic bishops are meeting um, as a big group, and they're talking about all kinds of things. Um, A a recent article from the Washington Post um, appeared with the headline, headline, Chastened Catholic Bishops Told They Have to Reform Themselves. Um, And the interesting thing about this is it's not that they're saying, oh, we really need to think rethink um, our stand on same-sex marriage or our stand on abortion or the HHS mandate. But it's rather a kind of call to, you know, we need to think about maybe how we're engaging um, in dialogue, in public, and within our churches. Um, So uh, Archbishop Cardinal Dolan um, said, U.S. Catholic bishops must now re-examine their own failings, confess their sins, and reform themselves if they hope to impact the wider culture. That's the way we we become channels of a truly effective transformation of the world, through our own witness of a repentant heart, Dolan said. The premier answer to the question, what's wrong with the world, is not politics, the economy, secularism, sectarianism, globalization, or global warming. None of these, as significant as, as they are, 
is the main problem. Instead, Dolan said, quoting English writer and Catholic convert G.K. Chesterton, the answer is contained in two words, I am. So various speakers at the conference restated, reiterated that they weren't going to change their beliefs or policy positions, but they needed to rethink their strategy. Stressing the theme of humility and the need to engage in a more dialogical way with those with whom they disagree. In their letter from 2007, the Catholic bishops um, made a statement the Catholics are calls, called to raise questions for political life other than are you better off than you were two or four years ago. Our focus is not on party, affiliation, ideology, economics, or even competence and capacity to for, perform duties, as important as these issues are. Rather, we focus on what protects or threatens human life and dignity. So much like Chris and Jim have said already, um, the bishops acknowledge that politics in our country is often a contest of powerful interests, partisan attacks, sound bites, and media hype. In contrast to this, they write that as Catholics, we should be guided more by our moral convictions than by our attachment to a political party or interest group. When necessary, our political participation should help to transform the party to which we belong. We should not let the party transform us in such a way that we neglect or deny fundamental moral truths. Um, now what I kind of want to submit here is that one of those fundamental moral truths um, is, you know, not, it's not, um, it's about how we engage in dialogue with one another and how we relate to those, especially those within the church with whom we disagree. Um, is it by sort of um, mirroring the cultural um, mode of engagement through sort of um, zingers and sound bites that make the other person look stupid or assuming that they're evil or um, trying to be deceptive? Um, or are there ways of actually engaging within the church um, that could offer a way of dealing honestly and charitable, charitably even with those with whom we disagree. Um, I don't know whether political unanimity and uniformity um, is possible or even desirable within the church, um, but I do hope that by engaging in dialogue and genuinely listening to reasons that other people come to different conclusions than us, um, the church can be more of the sacrament of unity that it's intended to be, rather than one more source of division and vitriol in our culture. Um, a November 9th post on the Catholic blog um, voxnova.com offers a few thoughts um, under the title Recovering from the Election Season. So this is kind of one of their attempts at talking about how can we recover and, you know, I mean, a few people have, have already sort of signaled, like, this has just been kind of ugly. Um, it's not something that people feel proud of. And it's something that I think within the Catholic Church, maybe even more than was already present, you know, it's kind of uh, re-entrenched a lot of the divisions that are there. So this writer says, as we begin to recover at the end of a tense election year that has taken its toll on all of us, it's also a time to begin asking ourselves, where do we as a church go from here? A robust Catholic moral vision is a good place to start. A politics of Catholic solidarity, well thought out, sufficiently provocative, full of conviction, yet noticeably nonpartisan. How about we try that out to witness and sow seeds of peace among this discord? Perhaps the most powerful starting point we have as Catholics is the Eucharist, this writer continues. This year's Election Day communion movement, though predominantly Protestant, has reminded us of this. Ben Irwin recently wrote, we can't go back to the status quo of polarization. We can't return to our own political idols. The bread and wine of communion have so much more to offer. Our prayers that we'll always remember we are knit together in Christ and no division can ever sever that bond. Our unity in the body and blood of Christ is and must always be deeper than mere niceness. It is a radical transformation 
first of the Eucharistic species, the elements themselves, then by extension, transformation of ourselves, and further, extension of our world. Let us remember and let us be Eucharist in the world, even in our politics. So um, I think that um, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a little wary of kind of pointing to the Eucharist as the kind of like magic bullet to solve everyone's problems, this sort of like, okay, well, just go to the Eucharist. And um, I, I don't want to say that people should just kind of uh, affirm a superficial unity, um, but rather kind of by, by recognizing um, people at a common table and getting to know them as people rather than um, you know, fellow Republicans or Democrats or people of the opposite conviction and allegiance, um, sort of recognizing um, you know, a common humanity and a common brotherhood and sisterhood and allowing for that um, space of dialogue to create a kind of understanding that maybe um, can then reshape the ways in which Maybe not the way, re, maybe not necessarily reshape the ways in which we vote, but at least the ways we engage with other people. Um, so, again, I I I don't know if that's a I don't I don't want to turn that into a kind of um, you know uh, sunshine and sparkly like spiritualization of this, uh, because the problems and divisions are real, um, and people disagree about real things. Um, but I think that um, maybe by, by really listening and not necessarily just thinking about how can I cut this person down and show that they're wrong, um, that, that's, that that's an important way of thinking about where we have to go from here. Okay. Um, questions? And what I'd like you to do is to uh, try and keep your question as direct and you can direct it to the person you want uh, to answer your question, but try to keep it as direct and concrete as you can. Uh, you can put it into context, but we don't want you to, you know, go into a long speech that lasts five or so minutes. Try and be more concrete and concise. But some questions. Yes. Now, I want to Dr. Blasky about the Catholic faith. Um, it's so divisive because there are there are two sides to it. There's there's some Catholics that focus on more like social welfare concerns with, and others that focus on more social issues themselves. Mm -hmm. So how how do those groups come together, or, or how should they come together? Mm -hmm. to talk about those two things because they're so they're so different, I guess, or their the concerns are very different. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question, Chris. And um, I think that you're right, that you know, there, there do tend to be these two camps. They're the ones who focus on um, kind of uh, poverty and you know, the sort of cluster of issues we think of as social justice, kind of caring for um, you know, those extending a safety net and caring for those who are vulnerable within societies. Um, and then there are others who focus on um, questions maybe that are more connected to sexuality. Um, you know, so, uh, and I think abortion kind of relates to that. You know, what do we do with the consequences of sexual activity? Um, how should we permit or not um, permit sexual freedom? I think the question of same-sex marriage was obviously very big in this recent election. Um, and is one of the things that, I mean, since, um, same-sex marriage was legalized in a number of states and in other states where there was a ban on same-sex marriage proposed, that was cut down. Um, that's kind of been one of the things that was mentioned in the article that I read from where the bishops are sort of saying, huh, like, like all of our efforts really didn't work. Um, I think in response to your question about how they come together, um, I think that Father O'Brien was actually pointing us in um, the right direction. So talking about um, a consistent ethic of life, you know, talking about what what actually um, fosters human life across the you know across that span. So saying that you know abortion is a serious concern, um, and we want to affirm like the sacredness of life 
in the womb. But we also want to make sure that, you know, we're not saying once you're born, you're on your own, you know. So, um, so I think that the challenge is for um, Catholics on both sides to recognize how those two positions have to be held together. Um, I have a little bit, I don't have as much to offer with respect to, um, you know, people who feel like, you um, you know, gay marriage and an acceptance of homosexuality is like a real threat to, um, to kind of Christian, to society. Um, I, I, um, I'll, I'll just be honest. I mean, it's just because I, I'm kind of baffled by the position myself that like with everything else our society has to deal with, that this is actually the thing that people feel most threatened by. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm struggling often with how exactly to talk to people who feel like that is the gravest threat that we face. Um, so maybe I can get back to you on that. But I think that, I think that the, the discussion uh, or focus on a more holistic and encompassing view of being pro-life is a place to start. Okay, yes. Um, in the vice presidential debate, they talked about the uh, pro-life, pro-choice, and since they're both Catholic, this will ask a question, but um, Paul Ryan and Joe Biden both said that as individuals, they're pro-life. However, when it came to the, what they wanted the government to do, Paul Ryan uh, felt like the government should step in and enforce pro-life, whereas Joe Biden didn't want to impose his beliefs on all other Americans. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the Catholic Church, is one right or one wrong, depending on, on their beliefs, since they're both Catholic? Um, also a good question. Um, I mean, I think that uh, a lot of people will say that this is a matter of prudential judgment. So, like, the Catholic Church and the bishops will often um, distinguish between, you know, certain things are principles. You know, like, in principle, we affirm the sacredness of life, you know, in the womb. Now, it's a matter of prudential judgment is the best way to honor that sacredness um, by uh, making abortion illegal, or is the best way to honor that, you know, through trying to shape people's own morals so that, you know, maybe they are, their, their abortions are less less necessary or less sought after. You know, so, you know, do you try to, do you, do you try to set kinds of, I mean, and even things like, you know, providing for, um, you know, ma maternal um, health care and providing, you know, needs um, or providing for the needs of young children and child care and all of these kinds of things that maybe make it a little easier to have a child. Um, you know, some people might say, maybe that's actually a way of decreasing abortion. And I think that, you know, I think that there's some strong evidence in favor of that perspective if you look at, um, you know, other countries and, and their records and even our own history of that. So in terms of what's right or wrong from the perspective of the, of the church, I think that there's, that there's sort of grounds for saying this is a matter of prudential judgment. Okay, other questions? Yeah. I had a comment to that. I was actually going to ask you to, yeah. Well, just today I, I saw an article that, that referred to uh, Romney as pro-life and, and Obama as pro-abortion. And I think in, in terms of the dialogue, that immediately messes up everything mm -hmm. because it distinguishes two issues. One issue is the act of abortion itself. Is that right or wrong? And I think just about everyone would say that is not a good thing in and of itself. The president is not pro-abortion. The president is, it is, okay, let's see. Uh, president and Biden said the same thing. He opposes abortion as a wrong. But how is, what's the best way to, to prevent that or to increase it? St. Augustine said, you can't do away with all evil. And so you can't. You have to try to curb the evil as much as you can. And so even in the Affordable Care Act, there is a huge amount of money in support of women who want to keep their child uh, in the pregnancy. 
that's a pro-life position. Uh, so if we clarify our language and stop using these extreme uh, monikers or something for, for each other, I think dialogue would be a lot mm -hmm. more simple. Yeah. Simple. On this particular issue, I, I actually think it would clarify a lot of things if we distinguish positions as pro-choice and anti-choice. Um, rather than being, you know, because I think that there that there are a lot of things um, that, um, you know, people who who disagree with abortion um, also support. You know, I mean, whether it's capital punishment or um, you know torture or um, you know lack of environmental regulations, they could be understood as not being particularly pro-life. So, I, I, but I think that that's a good comment. Our language does does affect the way in which these things are framed. It's more questions. I guess one for um, both Dr. Robleski, Robleski and Dr. Sedler. Um, the the nation seems pretty divided, uh, continuing with the pro-life and pro-choice. Um, so if we're talking about represent, representative government, that isn't that one of our biggest problems though because the country is divided not all people you know think you know not saying that we're all for abortion under any circumstances but a lot of people have different views you know abortion can, should be allowed in like certain situations but not in most situations so in the idea of representation how would you, why don't you take well, I, I, you know, Lindsay, I, I'd say the thing is, you know, for anybody who practices whatever faith, um, there's always going to be a tension in that in this society that you live in a democratic, secular society, and the issue is going to be whether or not you appreciate that society, and as the context with which you're going to practice your faith, and if you come into conflict with someone else. I think it's incumbent if you, again, beginning with the idea that you value democracy, you know that it's going to have disagreements, you know that people aren't always going to get along, can I still appreciate their view, can I understand where they're coming from, and I don't have to turn it into any kind of hateful language or anything else, but it's an appreciation that I just disagree with you, but we live in this context. And I think the Joe Biden comment in um, the vice presidential debate, I think, for me at least, is the right tack to take because there are many people who simply aren't this. But it puts you in a very hard position, especially in a situation of abortion, because if you really <coughs> truly believe that that's evil and that's murder and that's, how do, how do you, how can you possibly sanction it? And I think those are, those are just hard positions. And I, I don't know how you can ever fully overcome it other than trying to convince people other ways with which to change their view. And maybe they're not Catholic, but they can see value in um, the idea that abortion is not good in any situation. That makes um, sense? And I might just add to it, um, or just kind of reiterate, like the, um, that, that line that I quoted from earlier, um, when necessary, our political participation should help to transform the party to which we belong. Um, now that's in some, maybe sounds kind of radical and like a tall order. This is again my own speaking from my own personal perspective. I think a lot of the problems of representation and all kinds mm -hmm. of things, um, polarizations that we find in our culture, have to do with the fact that we have just two parties. Um, and so you get these kind of odd allegiances of, you know, the Republican Party, which has a certain kind of fiscal agenda, but then all these other kinds of more conservative social moral issues. So, you know, someone who supports same-sex marriage within the Republican Party often does not feel particularly comfortable. Um, but, you know, the same thing is, can be said of pro-life Democrats. Um, that it's it's there's a, a certain kind of party line, and I think that the um, you know the 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 development of the ways in which you know the country as a whole I think is is I don't know if it's more and more divided or if just the media culture has accentuated some of the um, the divisions. 
Um, but you know, I wonder if there are ways of thinking about you know creating n new ways of 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 understanding what those parties stand for. Um, or maybe even like if we're thinking longer term, like maybe maybe other kind of political party alternatives. Um, you know, I think I think the fact that everyone has to feel you know sort of shunted into one or another mm. political allegiance that may or may not um, you know really work for them um, is is part of part of the issue there. So maybe. Um, you know, maybe I don't, maybe I'm not addressing your question, but I think that you know some of the some of the divisiveness is because we have this um, kind of uh, binary. We only have two options. You know, it might be that people would be able to find a little bit of at least different ground, or it wouldn't be so polarized in divisiveness if there were kind of other ways of expressing political allegiance. You have a bunch of third party candidates, but they don't have enough money. They're not millionaires most of the time, so they can't, you know, start putting ads mm -hmm. out and start mm -hmm. getting donations. And I think that's part of the problem because I feel like most Americans would fall somewhere in that middle ground of maybe a third party. Mm -hmm. But since we don't know about the third parties and it takes so much effort and time to research them and we don't we don't have a lot of time to do all that. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's probably why we get pushed into one party or the other. Good question. Um, you know, I mean, Lindsay, as you as you you know, as you think about third parties, and 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 the other thing, I mean, because we we do see, unfortunately, for most Americans, even if we're unhappy with it, we do see two parties, and we think that's the natural lay of the land, and most people are not willing to reach out to gamble on a third party candidate because, well, my vote's not going to count. But of course the problem is your vote's probably not going to count anyway. And it's really about a changing the way that we just think about it. And I think that's what will get that third party or fourth party. And I would also say at some point that even as vast as the Democratic and Republican parties are, they each had huge tents. They had a lot of people in them. And and for, for some people I come across, and I will reveal something, for some people I come across as some kind of flaming liberal. And then other times I realize, you know, my positions are actually, I'm actually a liberal Republican. But they don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a serious problem, that the way that we're representing and in terms of reducing or, you know, having such large numbers of people to represent, you're driving away any kind of moderate or other way to look at it. So even if it's only two parties, there could have been, you know, five, six, seven different ways within each party. And that adds like 12 different choices you could have done if you break the representation down smaller. So it's just about being welcoming to other people. Um, some more questions? Yes, Ted? Chris, do you think that it's a, a problem of uh, the use of power by the leadership in the legislature and so that in order for them to both deliver a vote or deliver a bill that somehow they use extreme measures to leverage um, people that, that might disagree in their own party. It, if you if your investment and, and, and I would say if your investment is in being reelected you'll do you're not interested in changing the system you're not interested in doing anything you want to be reelected and as long as people are going to go along with it and that's and i mean that's the problem we're invested in it too so yes it's power okay somebody else said yeah <laughs> um, he said that the uh, majority of uh, it was one year, um, it's in the last 50 years, where people um, were confident that the government would do, I guess, what thought was that the government, they trusted government enough to do the right thing. Yes. Um, so it would seem as though now there is no faith or trust inside government. So how can we, in a way, find a unity under? America to find that trust. 
so if I if I understand you correctly, so if I'm looking at that issue of trust and I want to find a way to bring it to the surface, I can't do it other than changing the way that we think about question as long as you start to question your own system, you can bring that about because you start understanding what it is. And for me, I, I love democracy. Not everybody in the world agrees with that. I, I think it's messy. It's problematic. It leaves you uncomfortable. You have to be vulnerable to other people. And that's a scary place for most people. But I don't think it works unless you're committed to that process. You're not always going to agree, and disagreement is, is fine. People can say, I don't trust government. The question is, what, what does it mean for us Especially at a time, and that's the real problem of this, we just spent over a billion dollars. Six billion. Six billion, sorry. Okay, so we spent six billion dollars on something that doesn't really matter. That's insane to me. All the good that you can do in the world, even with people you disagree with, you could build a better school. You could build a better highway. You could do all kinds of things with it. But we just can't seem to wrap our minds around the fact that there's only 435 representatives. I can make the same argument, only 100 senators. If it's bad with the House, it's worse with the Senate. And it's even worse with the President. He represents everybody. I mean, it's just, I mean, but you have to or be, nobody. or nobody, which is, yeah, the, the, silent, the silent majority is what I represent, as Nixon used to say. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to yeah. have a follow-up question because both you and Jim hit this and you said basically this has been a wasted effort. I don't see that at all. I don't see this uh, whole election season. It's been ugly. It's been, I'm certainly tired of ads, but it's not been a wasted effort. We elected a president. We elected uh, new senators, new governors, new house representatives, even if not enough of them. And we went through a year of educating the American people about some of the key issues that we face. Uh, that doesn't mean that these issues are resolved, but many of the issues are raised. So when we have elections, why are we having elections? One of the reasons for frequent elections, wasn't it that, that you wanted the people to be close to the people? Mm -hmm. Well, the president, traveled and Romney traveled to all over the country for almost a year, appearing on the TVs and giving out ads and meeting with various people to try to have a handle on it. And senators did the same sort of thing. They didn't meet everybody, but back uh, when it was one per 330,000 people, they couldn't meet everybody then either. No. Mm -mm. And now our communications are much better, so it's almost impossible to avoid these people and, and coming into our home and telling us what they think and trying to win our support. So if anything, communications have made elections more intrusive in our lives. Uh, so I, I mean, I don't see this as a kind of waste. I mean, I think it's a process that we undergo every four years for the president and every two years for representatives. Uh, as a useful sort of thing that makes people aware of what problems America faces. That doesn't mean we can solve them easily. Uh, I guess I'm not so depressed as you guys are at the, the election process. It's when, you're, when you get to exercise your vote. It's, it's, the, it's the process and the way that we've gone about it as opposed to the other things that we could do. And I'll give you a perfect example that most people, which I didn't touch on, most people can't tell you what they actually expect presidents to do. If I said president's number one job was to take care of the laws that are faithfully executed and just to recommend to Congress from time to time what, that, that, what they thought was important, that's his constitutional duty. It's not to go around the country proclaiming this is my policy, vote for me. And we've so distorted what a job of the president is supposed to be, that's what I see as the waste. And there's actually a nice political science term for this that my students have learned this semester, and it's called monocracy. And it's where you have basically one person acting as a king in a representative government. 
And that's kind of the direction that we're going. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the waste because it doesn't have to be that. I, I'm all for go out, vote, do this, do that. And it's particularly in state and local elections, I think it's most important. But on a national, when you're not telling people, well, this is how I plan to represent, this is how, am I leading, am I following, am I getting this, am I getting, we're not really talking about what it is that we should be embracing in terms of the democracy other than vote. And information, Okay. I don't know how informed we actually, <laughs> exactly, exactly we are. So, Jim, would you like to? Yeah, well, just just the way it's presented, it's uh, it doesn't seem that the media are are really interested in trying to dig into substantial questions. It I, looks as if it's you know in a sense yeah. that, that that that's an interference, and that that the fact that we have very much oppose sources of information. So one being obviously prejudice toward one party and one the other party. There, you know, so much is driving us apart. And if government is really finally have to be cooperation, it just looks as if the way it comes to us just furthers the division. I point to the fact that the two uh, I believe they're both Republican long-term senators, said, I've had enough of this. So they've served the country for five, six terms. And they say, it's just not worth it any longer. Because they were trying to be moderates. They were willing to talk to people of the other party. They were trying to come to a solution by way of dialogue. And, and we've got people who, who uh, made the determination, for example, that there's no dialogue about taxes. And in fact, that what we think we can best do is to try to obstruct the government and at the same time criticize them for not being able to do what they would like very much to do, improve the economy. Now, it's very idealistic to talk about the millions that we spent I think all of this could come up with some better ways of improving our life and improving our promise for the future if that particular kind of divisiveness and deliberate kind of polarization was somehow or other avoided. That, that, that's the difficulty I had. We got to talk and we got to compromise. But the whole thing was set up, no, not to do that. <laughs> Well, I mean, ultimately, there will be compromises made and legislation is passed. And in fact, didn't the Founding Fathers want to make it somewhat difficult for government to do things? That's why mm -hmm. partly the Extremely separation difficult. of powers mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing, so that government couldn't do too much harm. I mean, most of the Founding Fathers thought of government as kind of a necessary evil. They're going mm -hmm. to do some bad. So we've got to try to keep them under control. And one is these frequent elections, you know. And they also, but they also didn't anticipate the government we have now, especially since the 1930s. That's just not even, it's supposed to be small, and most of your problems are going to be dealt with at the state mm -hmm. and local level. Right. And we've just completely thrown all that. And then can you actually function that way? I think you still can, but you have much more, you have a much greater obstacle to overcome just because of the size and the population. Okay, some more questions. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know, and this is, this is kind of like what uh, Father Stiles did. Like Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, uh, this, this is a, uh, Father Brown put this up earlier. He was talking about um, like how we how we go about helping this less fortunate. And um, I think that, that there are a lot, of, a lot of solutions to that. And a lot of times we just take one as, a, as an answer. You know, you know, bigger government to solve this problem or solve that problem. Um, but isn't isn't one of the Catholic Church's main teachings about subsidiarity, about dealing with like issues at the lowest level possible, or, or, or the lowest level of governance possible? Possible. So one of my one of my biggest questions, I guess, is why why so many why so many Catholics think that the best way to handle handle issues is at is at the, the federal level, or even 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 the state level. <clears throat> can I address that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so so the, the this. 
talk of subsidiarity has been thrown around a lot this election because I think it is often interpreted to say like we want to keep government out of things. The, the actual teaching on subsidiarity um, is that things should be done at the lowest level possible but at the the largest level necessary. So, you know, I mean, it might be the case, and, and, and I mean, I often try to explain it by saying that subsidiarity has to go is sort of one side of the coin and solidarity is the other side of the coin. So it's, it's not saying that, you know, we, we want to just do everything at the federal level. And I think that people who are, um, you know, who are kind of calling for sort of state assistance for, you know, food stamps or um, health care or other things like that, um, I don't know if it's necessarily saying, look, we want government to do everything, but it's sort of saying, you know, maybe we do need to have coordinated solutions that are going to be better if we actually do have some uniformity. I mean, I think that, but then that's kind of one of those matters of prudential judgment. You know, you could say something should be done by families, something should be done by cities or neighborhood associations. Some things you need to have, you know, counties or state governments. And other kinds of things, you really have to, you know, have a kind of federally coordinated system. Maybe, you know, emergency uh, natural disasters are the kind of thing that having something that is federally coordinated is actually necessary. So, but that's just one example. I don't know. Did yeah. you? Maybe it is. And say what you think about it, Chris. There's an awful lot of complaint. In fact, uh, Mr. Obama suffers. A terrible defeat in West Virginia because people are convinced that there's a, he has a war going on coal and that these restrictive federal agencies are what's causing us problems, lack of jobs and, and so forth. Now, I want to suggest that if subsidiarity were being used, what has to happen is the industry itself mm -hmm. has to police itself and that the federal folks show up because the industry isn't doing that. So the kind of responsibility about working for the well-being of the people uh, with whom you're, you're doing your business, in this case, coal, if the federal government's in there because the folks aren't doing their job, I, I think, of paying attention to what are restrictions with water, with pollution soil, and and something that we haven't gotten to, and I think we're going to be shot at, is what's happening in the atmosphere, you know, air pollution. Dr. Stout's a real good example of that, I think, trying to encourage people at the local, uh, at the local level to find out what's really happening in terms of their purity of water and purity of air, so that we can get some facts to present in, in order to bring about an improvement. We'd like to think that the industri industry itself would do that. So, you know, I think that's a question of subsidiarity that you know, could be pretty healthy for us. I. You had a question. Well, I think go ahead. Are we supposed to go much past eight thirty? Not much. Okay. We've reached. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We have reached eight thirty, and uh, that's probably an hour and a half with you and. That's about the time we can set aside. Yeah. So. If there's more that needs to be said there, I just didn't want to go We could take a couple more questions if they have them. Some pressing <laughs> questions? I did have one, and this was directed at Chris. Of course. You, you <laughs> mentioned. Father, Father Stadler. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that you would prefer a longer than two-year election cycle mm -hmm. for, for members of the House. And earlier you mentioned that, you know, only about 100 out of 435 seats are probably at, competitive. At competitive. You know, it might be a little more some years, a little less than others because of the way in which they drew the districts and so forth. Uh, but if you make that a longer election cycle and there are fewer people who are competitive, aren't you insulating House people even more from their constituents oh. than they ordinarily would be? I, I, you have to do both. You have to work, you have to work at both. And if you start out with representing 
uh, with smaller numbers of, of, of people being represented, th they'll demand more. On, on one level, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't care if we have par I don't care if we have parties. If you're, if the goal is to pick, the, as the framer, as the wisest person to discern and to be thinking about stuff, that that's what matters. And you'll hold that person accountable because they'll have a much more uh, stronger connection with you. And and I think they will not be as concerned about power and always having to run. Because I don't think Congress people appreciate this two-year cycle. Mm. There's a guy, there's a famous story about Landslide Joe. He won by a couple hundred <coughs> votes in Connecticut, and then the day after he won, he started out on the road campaigning, and he won by a landslide the second time. But he had to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And, and I think you just take away so much time and again, it's what we want to get at with the representative. It, does it matter if they're there for 20 or 30 years? They're there now anyway. So, but if they're doing a good job and representing you and you like what they're doing, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily even think term limit. And we go to lots. I, I mean, you know, it's the job that matters, not exactly the, the, the time frame or the process. That kind of hits the other question that I had in my mind I was going to ask. But you indicate we don't have enough representatives. There are over 135. Mm -hmm. How big would it be? How big would Congress I don't, get? I don't know. Because you know, the bigger it is, sometimes the harder it is for to have a meaningful impact upon a body. It it, it all depends. It, again, the waters it, down there. It influence. depends on it. Well, but it depends on what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to start from that perspective of what is the purpose. And once you start with the purpose, does it? I mean, it could be. A th I mean, I don't know. I mean, if the if the French, the Germans, and the English can pull it off with a lot more, I don't. And I would say that they probably think that they have too little for some. But the question is, what are you trying to accomplish? Okay. Well, anyway, thanks for your attendance. Hopefully, you'll come again, and hopefully, you found uh, this informative and entertaining.